I think this is the first part of this playthrough that doesn't start with me exiting the Pokemon Center. Anyway, welcome back to the Pokemon Fire Red playthrough. Here from Lavender Town you can go two ways. You can go south or you can go west. Well, technically you can also go north, but that's where we just came from, so no point in going there. Though in reality you can only go west, because as we go south you're gonna see in a minute that we can't progress further than this. Why? Because there's this fat ass Pokemon slipping on the road! He's fat! Exactly! But for whatever reason we can just try to attack it or capture it or do anything with it until it wakes up. So we can't really do anything here right now. Except for this. This is a mechanic that was added in Generation 3 so they thought why not include it on the Generation 1 remakes. These are double battles. Instead of your usual one on one it's pretty much a two on two. You choose a move and then you also choose which Pokemon you're going to hit with it. You can even attack your partner, like you can have your own Pokemon fight each other for like no reason. And then there are also some other attacks who are pretty much made for double battles, who aren't really that useful in single battles. Like sort of a team up move or a move to make your partner's attack even stronger. Then there are also moves like Rock Slide for example who can hit both the opponents at once. Or Magnitude that can hit all three opponents, and by all three opponents I mean your two opponents and your partner, so that's not a very good idea, unless your partner is a flying type. Now you can just treat it like any other battle, where you just have one Pokemon attack one Pokemon and the other Pokemon attack the other Pokemon. But if you want to do double battles competitively, you really have to utilize the double battle mechanics. That in Generation 5 they make it even worse because they add triple battles. Which is pretty much the same thing, just with three Pokemon instead of two. But there you also have to think a bit more about positioning, because your Pokemon on the far right can hit the opponent Pokemon on the far left, for example. But those are triple battles and those aren't until way, way, way later. Right here we just got a TM by the name of Return. Return is a move that gets stronger the higher your Pokemon's happiness stat is. Meaning it didn't exist back in Generation 1, because in Generation 1 there was no happiness stat. Unless you count the Pikachu in Pokemon Yellow. There's also a move that's the opposite of return, which is frustration, which gets stronger and stronger the lower your Pokemon's happiness stat is. However, that move is pretty useless, because your Pokemon's happiness stat can only get higher and higher unless you use specific items on it, but then still, it's just gotta keep going up again. As for return, it's a very powerful normal type move when you're at maximum friendship, but even then there are better attacks with side effects that don't need some sort of extra thing to be stronger. So yeah, even though it's strong, I just never really bought it with return. But now it's finally time to make progress and go through route 8. So let's talk about this old man. This old man is our first gamer trainer. In the original they were called gambler trainers, but we can't have our kids exposed to the word gambling. Other madness. I think there was also a gamer trainer on the right to Vermilion City, a route I didn't really go because if you go too far to the right, you find the exact same sleeping Snorlax. So yeah, where we were a few minutes ago with the sleeping Snorlax, if you go to the left there, which you can't because there's a sleeping Pokemon in the way, you end up back in Vermilion City. But I will be going to that route eventually. But there was one more thing about the gambler training we're fighting right now. In the original, if memory serves me correctly, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he could be used for two certain glitches. One glitch I mentioned earlier with these very special Pokemon that you can't actually obtain in the game. The same goes for the Youngstar I mentioned back on Route 24 or 25 or I don't even remember. But yeah, those two trainers are used to obtain that very special Pokemon. It has something to do with which Pokemon the game sends out to you. is dependent on which special stat that is. Some shortcut in the coding, I don't really know. So I'm not really gonna go into detail of that. But I think there's also another glitch with that old man, something about how he is the last trainer you can fight and then you have somehow beaten the game or something. You know what, never mind, I really don't know what I'm talking about so I'm just gonna shut up now. I mean my information can just be incorrect, so if someone can correct me, please do so. But uh, going back a bit, that old man had a Growlithe and a Vulpix. I don't think I've mentioned before, but Growlithe is exclusive to the Red and Fire Red version. Vulpix, which is also a fire type, is pretty much the opposite, or its counterpart. It's also exclusive to the leaf green, green and blue versions. They're both found in the same area depending on which version you have, and they both evolve by using a specific item on them, which we'll be seeing later, in fact. 
But yeah, he's also one of those trainers who uses two Pokemon that are both found in different versions, just like the trainer who used both an Oddish and an Bellsprout. Anyway, new Pokemon! This is Muck, the evolution of Grimer. It pretty much evolved from a blob to a... bigger blob. And then it uses the move Minimize to make itself smaller again, ironically. Anyway, the move Minimize raises your evasion by two stages, and use that a few times and you can get me really, really annoyed. Now that I think about it, I don't think I've explained stages. Stages are for the increasing and lowering of status moves. When a battle begins, all the stats of all the Pokemon will always be at stage 0. But if you were to use like a stat lowering move like Leer on that Pokemon, it will bring that Pokemon's defense stats from stage 0 to stage minus 1. But if a Pokemon were to use like Defense Curl, it would bring its defense back from minus 1 to 0, and then if it used it again, it will bring its defense to plus 1 stage. But there are limitations to it. You can't just keep increasing and increasing a Pokemon's defense stat. You can only increase it until it's stage plus 6 or decrease it until it's stage minus 6. If you try to make it higher than plus 6 or lower than minus 6, the move will simply fail. Anyway, back to what's happening on screen. Diglett evolved into Ductrio, meaning it's now... Free Diglets. With angry eyes. Wow, such a creative evolution. Generation 1 is surely the best in having creative evolutions and it is totally the best for every single reason. I'm sorry, I just hate it when people say like, Generation 1 had the best Pokemon designs. No, that's nostalgia. Look at this thing. It's three times the Pokemon it was before, literally. Uh, I just, I, I hate Gen winners. There are so many things pointing to the fact that Generation 1 wasn't the best. On many, many regards. But moving on from that, I have a minor thing to correct. Earlier I said that Minimize raises your evasion by two stages. This only goes for Generation 5 and beyond. Generation 1 up to 4, it just raises your evasion by one stage. So that's one thing I missed. The other thing I missed is that Ductrio, or Duck, which is still a female by the way, tried to learn a new move. That move was Sandtomp, which does very little damage, but it places sort of an invisible status effect on the Pokemon, where at the end of every turn it just gets hit by a tiny sandstorm and it will do a little bit of damage and it wears off after a while. Then there's also Whirlpool, which is like the water version of that exact same move. Oh look, a Nidorina. The Pokemon I should have gotten instead of Nidorino, just because I prefer it. It's not necessarily better. One thing I forgot to mention before is that the male Nidoran and its evolutions are more so focused on attacking power and offensive power, where the female Nidoran and its evolution are focused on defensive power. That's not necessarily a difference I prefer for one over the other. I can go either way. But again, I just prefer the design of Nidorina over Nidorino, and the same goes for its evolutions. Oh, it's time for another double battle. This part is all about the double battles. These two use a Clefairy and a Jigglypuff, two Pokemon that will later be changed to Fairy types. It's almost like they knew ahead of time. These two are also in the Fairy Egg group, in case you're wondering about breeding. And they're both tiny and pink and they both evolve by using a Moonstone. Also they both get baby evolutions in Generation 2, so I guess they're sort of counterparts of each other, even though they're not exclusive to the different versions. By the way, like I said a few seconds ago, the different egg groups have names like Water 1 and Water 2 and the Fairy Egg Group. The Fairy Egg Group was always around before they actually had the Fairy type. So that's sort of interesting. Also, most Pokemon within the Fairy Egg Group got changed to Fairy types. Not all of them, but still a bunch of them. Pikachu, for example, is in two different egg groups. It's in the Fairy Egg Group, but also in the Field Egg Group, and it never becomes a Fairy type of any sort. Though Pikachu does have its own fairy type lookalike by the name of The Den. But now I'm just going way too far into the future. This game was released in 2004? Oh my god, I just realized that's 10 years ago. Ugh. It's 2014 now and we're about to get remakes of Generation 3 games. Not, not, not this one, because this one is already a remake and... Yeah. We're fighting an old man. This old man has a Poliwag. It is a water type. And it is the favorite Pokemon of Pokemon's creator. Or at least his favorite Generation 1 Pokemon. I'm not sure if that's changed anything at all, but I don't know. I'm just reading the trivia list. But a bit more of a personal matter. That pink thing it had, it is supposed to be a mouth. I know it's supposed to be a mouth, but I will never see it as a mouth. Mostly because 
its evolution actually doesn't have that, and then the spiral thingy is sort of treated as its mouth, so I'll see that pink thing as a nose. Also, I think that Polywax, or at least one of Polywax Pokedex entries, describes that the spiral thingy is not just a pattern, it's actually supposed to be a hole there. You can see its guts through it, or something like that. The Pokedex entries are weird. But a bit more general information about Polywag. Uh, like I said, it has an evolution, and if you give it a water stone after that, it evolves again. But also, if you trade it holding the King's Rock item, it will evolve into a different Pokemon, but that's not until Generation 2. Though all the Generation 2 and 3 Pokemon are programmed into this game, you're just not allowed to obtain any of them until later, until you beat the Elite Four at least once. After that you can obtain all the Generation 2 Pokemon, but then you have to do a whole different thing, which I'll be showing off to obtain Generation 3 Pokemon. Or at least, now that I'm thinking about it, the game describes it as, after you do that side quest, you can now trade Pokemon with Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire are the Generation 3 games that came out before these remakes and those aren't remakes. But I suppose that maybe if you have a friend who did do the side quest without you doing that side quest and he has Generation 3 Pokemon on his Fire Red and Leaf Green games, maybe you can get Generation 3 Pokemon onto your game without doing that side quest. I'm honestly not really sure. So. If you know the answer, please leave a comment, I appreciate it. And while you're at it, I'm actually not even sure if you're even allowed to trade Pokemon with Fire Red and Leaf Green games, period, before beating the Elite Four once. I mean, probably yes, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to obtain any Generation 1 Pokemon, like Gengar and Alakazam that needed to be traded. However, that could also mean that you could be able to obtain Generation 2 Pokemon that require trading with a certain item to get those Pokemon anyway before beating the Elite Four, so I really don't know, or will those Pokemon just refuse to evolve before you get the Elite Four, even if you do trade those Pokemon with that I, I don't know. I can look it up, but I don't know which keywords to type into Google in order to find that. So in the meantime, I forgot to talk about the evolution of Poliwag we saw on screen, which was Poliwhirl. It's um, it's alright, I guess. I do actually like its evolution, the Generation 1 evolution, because it becomes a water fighting type, and I don't think we have a lot of those. And right now we're also fighting a Growlithe. We've seen Growlithe before, but this one is different because it will be mine. As I said before, Growlithe is exclusive to the Red and Fire Red version, so if you're playing American Blue, Japanese Green or Leaf Green versions, you won't be able to find this thing, but instead you will find a Vulpix, which is also a fire type. In the end, whether you play Fire Red or Leaf Green is all decided by which of the exclusive Pokemon you like better. And I like Vulpix, but I just like Growlithe a little bit better. There are some Pokemon in the Leaf Green exclusive category that I like better than some of them in the Fire Red exclusive category, but there are more exclusives in the Fire Red version that I like better, I guess. Actually, at first the plan was to play Leaf Green version, because that's the one I grew up with, but then when I was planning out my team of Pokemon that I wanted to use, it was like, oh, when I use this Pokemon, no, no, it's exclusive to this version, well, then I use this Pokemon, which is also exclusive to the other version. <gasps> Never mind. So instead, I played the Fire Red version, and speaking of fire, we cut ourselves a Growlithe, and I named it Ignis, because that's the Latin word for fire. I name a lot of Pokemon after just Latin words because I suck at nicknaming these things. When I play Generation 2, I'm probably just gonna name all my Pokemon after French words, and in Generation 3, maybe after German words? But now that we have Ignis in our party, or, well, not yet in our party, because our party is full at the moment, which means someone else may have to go. But not for now, because apparently I don't put the Growlithe in my party right away. I don't know why. I should have done that. Go back, please. Nope, okay. Oh, but wait, this is actually important. Uh, remember those guards that won't let us into that certain city and they always end their sentences with, I'm thirsty. In the original, you have to get them a soda pop from a vending machine. In this version, you have to get them tea. And tea you can't really buy anywhere, so you have to get the tea from this specific lady. Actually, I don't remember if you have to give the guard soda pop. It May just have been a water, but... Well, anyway, we are now in Celadon City, and the most important part of Celadon City is probably this place, where you can buy... 
pretty much everything. Well, not anything, but most things you can buy are most likely to be found here. For example, on this floor you can buy TMs, and they actually show you which TMs you can buy as opposed to Generation 1 where they just showed the number of TM and then you don't know what the actual attack is, so then you actually have to buy it in order to check which attack it is. This person right here can sell us Pokeballs and Revives and pretty much the same things you can buy in the normal Poke markets around Kanto. I'm trying to remember if it was here or in some sort of hotel in Celadon City, but I remember there somewhere in Generation 1 there was an invisible PC. The coding for the PC was still there, but there was no sprite for it. Oh look, a Super Nintendo. And if we talk to the guy in the top, he will say that he's trading a Hunter and then suddenly it will change. It's sort of hinting at the fact that Hunter is one of the Pokemon that needs a trade evolution. Oh, this is the point where I waste a little bit of time because uh, this person is a move tutor who can teach us the move counter and I consider giving it to Venetum, but I decide not to, so 20 seconds of time wasting. But what the move counter does is when the Pokemon using counter gets hit by an attack, it will then follow up with an attack twice as powerful as what it just got hit by. So if your opponent doesn't use a damage dealing move, counter will have nothing to counter, so the move will just fail. And lastly, counter is also a decreased priority move. It has a priority of minus 5, so it will always move last, unless your opponent uses a move of priority minus 6 or something. No, looks like we're not completely gonna be time wasting, because it turns out I actually teach the move to mascot. Why the mascot? I don't know. Let's just say I may need another fighting type move in my party. But hey, don't I already have Monk Woman who already has two fighting type moves? Exactly. I am horrible at foreshadowing and being ominous, so I'm just gonna say it outright. Uh, Monk Woman is leaving our party soon because I now have a Growlithe. I'm sorry, it's been fun, but we all have to move on sometime. I'm sure you'll be happy in the PC box with your new friends. Nameless Pokemon 1 and 2. Anyway, what do they sell here? Boca doll? Retro Mill? The fuck is this? Oh, a Firestone, that's good. Yes, like I said before, here you can buy the Evolutionary Stones. Not all of them, I don't think you can buy any sort of Moonstone here, but um... Yeah, after Generation 1 you can't really buy them anywhere anymore. You just have to find them and you can only find a limited amount of them, so there's no room for error anymore. But that's it. Apparently I don't show off that you can also go to the roof of the Celadon City store. And there's someone there that can give you DMs depending on what drinks you give to that trainer. So giving fresh water will get you the DM for a light screen, giving a soda pop will get you safeguard, and giving a lemonade will get you reflect, which are all defensive moves. The DMs that person will give you were actually much, much better in generation 1, where fresh water will get you ice beam, soda pop will get you rock slide, and lemonade will get you tri attack. But moving on from that, if we go to the roof of this building, we can get a free Pokemon by the name of Eevee. Eevee is a very popular Pokemon and has sort of a special evolutionary line. It can evolve into a Vaporeon when you give it a Waterstone, a Jolteon if you give it a Thunderstone, and into a Flareon when you give it a Firestone. Those are the three things that can evolve into in Generation 1. Then in Generation 2 they add two more, then in Generation 4 they add another two, and then they add another evolution in Generation 6. So it will always start out as an Eevee, which is sort of the blank one, it's a normal type, and then you can change its type depending on how you evolve it. Because giving it a water stone will also make it a water type and etc etc. My personal favorite is the ice type, Glaceon, which Eevee can evolve into, but that's not until generation 4. But yeah, that's where you can get an Eevee and you can evolve it into a fire type, a water type, or an electric type. I was considering using Flareon, the fire one, but I ended up using Growlithe instead. Which, speaking of Growlithe, I still haven't put him in my party, but first we went into that house and we talked to that man who gave us a coin case, so now we can buy coins and go gambling. I don't think I'm ever gonna show off the gambling in this game, so... It's pretty much a slot machine, you throw coins in it and there's a small chance you get more coins, but it's most likely you're just gonna lose coins and... It's gambling. You can then use those coins in the store next door to trade them for items or even some specific Pokémon. But I never bother with the gambling itself, so I'm just gonna buy all the coins I need and then use those in the store instead of actually using them in the slot machine to get more because I'll never get any more. But hey, if you wanna try, go ahead, I just don't recommend it and I am gonna need a few things from the store that needs coins to buy things. So I'm just gonna sell a lot of things to get a lot of money to buy a lot of coins to buy those specific items. 
but that's not until way later. Also, the person I just talked to gives us an HM, so you need to talk to that person because that is a required HM. I think. No, I don't think it's required, but it's still very, 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 very useful. It is the HM for fly. You can teach it to a Pokemon and then that Pokemon will be able to fly you to any city you've already been to. However, you can't really use it just yet because you still have to beat a certain gym before you can use it outside of battle. But yeah, unless you want to ride your bicycle everywhere, I seriously recommend getting it. Also, speaking of getting anywhere, we can't really get out of Celadon City, at least not to the right, because there's another goddamn sleeping Snorlax in the way. So I decided to take out my anger on a little double battle. These are Ninetales and Rapidash. Ninetales is the evolution of Vulpix and needs a Firestone to evolve. Rapidash is the evolution of Ponyta and just evolves when it reaches a certain level. Let's see, Ponyta evolves into Rapidash at level 40. Hey! This Rapidash is level 29, what the fuck is that shit? It's unfair, cheating! This person is cheating! Actually, Generation 1 does this a lot, where people use Pokemon at levels when they shouldn't be those Pokemon yet. When they shouldn't have evolved yet, but they're those evolutions anyway. So, Generation 2 also does it to an extent, and they get better with it over time, but it's still cheating! Actually, now that I think about it, Generation 2 is kind of worse with it than Generation 1 is. They do it a lot more often, so... But after that, it gets better, I swear. In the meantime, I'm putting that magnitude to good use. Making a minor sacrifice because Aqua is gonna get hit by that as well. But it doesn't kill it, and even if it does, I can just walk back to the Poké Center. Oh, by the way, I'm not sure if this goes for all double battles, but I know that most double battles aren't triggered when you stand in front of the trainers. You have to talk to them first before the battle triggers. So I think if you want to, you can just ignore all the double battles. No, I'm not sure if this goes for all double battles. I think there's one near the end of the game where you don't have to fight them, but you will still have to fight them when they see you. But I'm pretty sure that's the last double battle we're gonna see for a while. There are not that many of them, and I just made sure to show off most of them in one video, so I could call this video Double Battles. But I think that about wraps it up for today. Thank you for watching, and next time we're going through the Rocket Warehouse. I see you then.